um, the topic of today's uh, lecture is going to be um, forecasting and valuation specifically for recurring revenue businesses. Uh, the forecasting we're going to do is going to be primarily bottom-up forecasting. Depending on how you choose to implement the specifics of your forecasting, there might be some top-down elements to it as well. But it'll be pretty clear as we work through a standard forecasting and valuation exercise uh, for this type of business that uh, most of the steps that we're undertaking in the forecasting process starts from disaggregating at the customer level and really building up our forecasts of revenue, uh, operating income, and uh, in part two of the lecture we'll also start talking about the other components of uh, the cash flow uh, equation uh, as well. Um, now, before we actually start talking and actually kind of going through examples where we go through both legs of this exercise, forecasting and valuation, I want to kind of motivate a little bit why I chose to kind of present specifically on this topic. And when I say this, uh, what I mean is specifically on the topic of recurring revenue businesses. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I, I want to actually just kind of show you real world data on two companies. Oops, sorry, I need to change this from. Okay. Right, so what I have here is over two periods, right, data for two software companies. I'm gonna to refer to it as a tale of two software companies because right now we look at this. This is data on revenues and millions of dollars over three successive years for two software companies. Revenue standpoint, they look very similar. They're high growth companies, right? So in period one, roughly revenues of $50 million goes up to roughly 100 million after two years or in period in, in year two and then in year three you know between let's say 140 and 160 million dollars right so two companies so far they look very similar uh, both you know we would classify as being um, you know relatively large let's say for a private company and high growth companies however these two companies start to Div uh, diverge from each other or show a stark difference in their patterns when instead of looking at revenues, we look at operating income. So the first company, again, this is based off of real world data and I'll tell you what the two companies are uh, shortly, but we can see the first company or the company on the left bar, right? You can see in addition to being you know, relatively large and um, as a private company, and it's, it's also quite profitable. Right, so it's got profits about you know, $10 million in uh, the first year. In the second year, that goes up to about 30 million, um, or no, maybe like 25 million, and it goes up to about 40 million in the third year, right? So in addition to being a high growth uh, company in terms of revenue, it's a fairly profitable company as well, and its profits are increasing over time. I mean, in some sense, when we think of very good companies, we think of companies like that, right? Their revenues are growing quickly and their profitability or their you know, dollar profits are going up over time as well. Now, if we look at the second company, even though it has very similar revenues, it shows a very different pattern in terms of uh, profitability. So in terms of operating income, right? On a similar amount of revenue, rather than in year one, uh, having operating profits of 10 million, it's losing close to 50 million. Uh, year two, you know, roughly, let's say, minus 75 million, a little bit less than that, and then almost minus 100 million in year three. Right? So even though this company has relatively large revenues, again, for a private company, that are growing quickly, it's got substantial losses as well, and those losses are getting larger and larger over time. You know, one interpretation of the second company, the company at the right, is, you know, it's a company that's destroying, you know, one interpretation would be that it's a company that's destroying value, right? Because one way to generate a pattern like we see here would be, for instance, if a company sold dollar bills for 60 cents, right? It's pretty easy to generate the, uh, revenue if you sell dollar bills for less than a dollar, right? Because everyone would want to purchase that from you. But of course, you would be losing money along. That would be one thing that's consistent with this. 
Now it's going to turn out the companies on the right are not that, you know, aren't companies that are clearly uh, uh, destroying value. Uh, and in particular, if we look at these two sets of companies, the first company on the left is a traditional software company. Notably, it's Microsoft in the three years before its IPO. So in the three years prior to Microsoft's IPO, this was its revenue and this was its operating income. So it's a real company. The second company is, it's not an individual company, it's actually the average of a sample of a particular type of company, which is a sample of SaaS IPO companies from 2012 to 2019. And all of this data that I'm pre presenting to you guys in the slides is in the spreadsheet that I provided to you guys in my email as well. So all of this stuff is off of real world data. Right? So this is pretty much the average trajectory of revenues and operating income for software as a service um, companies that went public in the last loosely speaking decade. Right? So this is like the typical trajectory for these types of companies. By the way, software as a service is, and, and you know, versus a traditional software company, traditional software companies, the, the nature of their transactions is, they would sell a perpetual license to their software product, right? So you would pay a relatively large price for the software product up front, but then you could use the software product forever. As we know, software as a service, what happens is instead you essentially rent use of the software, right? So you have a, a per period license where maybe you pay monthly or you pay annually, right? So you pay less on a per period basis, but you need to keep paying uh, every period uh, in order to keep being able to use the software product. And so that's gonna be a fundamental difference between what I call you know, either a traditional software or a traditional business model and uh, a recurring revenue business model, where at the customer level, the customer keeps coming back on a predictable and repeatable basis. And it's gonna turn out that that difference in the nature of the customer is gonna have a substantial impact in how we wanna approach both forecasting what the future financials of the company are gonna be like, and also uh, how we approach valuation of these companies. But yeah, so as I said, this is, uh, again, this pattern is just meant to be representative of the difference that you see between high growth companies that are, you know, traditional one-shot transaction generation of business versus recurring revenue, a customer continues uh, generating uh, cash flows and profits for your uh, company on a, on a repeated basis. So it's not just specifically traditional software versus software as a service. We also see this slightly unusual pattern of, you know, large positive high growth revenues coupled with large losses that become increasingly negative. We see that pattern also with um, other types of recurring revenue businesses. And I'm going to show you guys some examples of, uh, of, of non-software uh, recurring revenue uh, businesses shortly. But maybe before I do that, you know, one of the reasons why I chose SaaS as an example to highlight this distinction between this company and this company um, is basically related to the fact that SaaS has grown tremendously in terms of its kind of role in public markets uh, over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, so just, you know, one bit of data to highlight the rise of SaaS, you know, which is one motivation for why we care about being aware of, as I said, this kind of rightmost pattern here is because SaaS is becoming more important in public markets. Um, so what I have here is data on the closest thing that we can find uh, as an index that gives us a sense of, of, of SaaS over time. So this isn't SaaS per se, it's a cloud index, but pretty much everything, like most of the companies in this cloud index, so specifically it's a, the cloud index is called the Emerging Cloud Index. It's produced by BVP, which is Bessemer Venture Partners. It's one of the large and prominent um, venture capital firms uh, in the Bay Area. 
Uh, so they create this uh, index. It's an index that tracks the performance of 50 um, kind of high growth cloud related companies. Almost all, pretty much all of those companies are selling software on a recurring revenue basis. It doesn't cover the entirety of SaaS and it certainly only covers a small sliver of recurring revenue. So for instance, other examples of recurring revenue businesses that would not be SaaS would be, for instance, a company like Amazon is clearly recurring revenue, right? When they're thinking about customer acquisition, they're not thinking just about how much money are they gonna make from an Amazon customer in today's transaction. They're thinking about, well, on a repeated basis, how many purchasing transactions would we expect that uh, customer have? Netflix wouldn't be in the emerging cloud index either. Um, you know, Google, a large component of, of their business is on a recurring revenue basis. So there's a large number, there, you know, there's quite a few large uh, market cap companies that aren't even in this index. But even if we consider just this sliver, this sliver of the market has an aggregate market cap of $1.5 trillion. Uh, I think all of the companies here are uh, publicly traded in the US. So if we just think about this index, I think aggregate market cap of stocks in the US is maybe something to the order of maybe 35 trillion at the moment. Uh, so 1.5 trillion is you know, a non-negligible percentage of that, given that it's only a small subset of recurring revenue. Um, you know, it does give us a sense of the importance uh, of, of uh, recurring revenue business models uh, within the economy, especially uh, the stuff that's publicly traded. We can also see from charting this index over time um, just how much the prominence of SaaS has grown over time. Um, so, you know, if you invested in mid 2013, a dollar in a in in this you know emerging cloud index, so in this representative sample of cloud SaaS companies, um, that one dollar would now be nine dollars, right? As opposed to, for instance, if you invested in the S and S and P five hundred, one dollar would now be two dollars, right? So this kind of highlights a these companies have performed very well which by the way, I should mention, highlights the fact that this isn't necessarily a bad sign because the companies that are in this index, those are the companies that are part of this IPO sample. This is how they're performing prior to the IPO, right? So this is their operating performance prior to the IPO. And after the IPO, their stock returns are spectacular. Right? So it's not like you look at this and you say, well, this is a bad company. Right? There's obviously something good about these companies on average, because if we look at the stock market performance, it's been, it's been very strong. Uh, Google, uh, so Bruce uh, just asked a question. Um, uh, is Google and Netflix in the index? I don't think either of them are. Um, uh, but, well, Google definitely is not. Uh, I don't believe Netflix is either. But if actually, if you just bear with me for one second, I'll be able to check because I have the entire index in that spreadsheet that I sent to you guys. Uh, yeah, so Netflix is not in there either. But clearly, Netflix is a, a recurring revenue business, right? Um, so it does share similarity from uh, kind of a purely fundamental standpoint uh, to these uh, cloud SaaS companies. Yeah, but hopefully this motivates a bit um, why we should care about the specificities of uh, tackling forecasting financials and valuation of both SaaS companies and more generally recurring revenue. By the way, if we included recurring revenue, in um, our tally of publicly traded companies and, and, and computed the aggregate market cap there, it would become dramatically larger than 1.5 trillion, right? I mean, just think about adding Amazon, basically all the FANG stocks, I think, are examples of companies that have a large component of their businesses that can be classified as recurring revenue, right? So it's an important segment of the market. Um, now again, this is, this is showing us data 
right? So this chart here, so this pattern, can you guys see the little hand arrow when I'm moving it around or no? No, okay, so then I should not be using my mouse to point things out on the slide. Um, let's see, can you see it now or no? Oh yeah, okay, you can see it. Can you see the hand when I wave it? Yeah, we can see the hand. I thought you said okay, it's it's small, but yeah. Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure because if you guys can't see it, it really is useless for me to uh, um, to, to to use to use that. Uh, okay, so what we've done here is we've shown this pattern for SaaS companies, right? And I've also made the claim that recurring revenue companies exhibit a similar pattern. So what I want to do next is I just want to show you guys some examples of non SaaS recurring revenue companies, prominent ones that went public in recent years. And I want to show you guys that loosely speaking, the pattern that we see here, high growth on the high growth on the revenue side, but operating losses that are becoming larger. I want to show you that that pattern also holds for some of the more prominent recurring revenue businesses as well. Again, mainly to convince you guys that the stuff I'm going to show you guys next in terms of how we approach forecasting financials and valuation applies for both recurring revenue and SaaS. Again, SaaS I think of as a subset of recurring revenue. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you guys some additional, again, real world data of recurring revenue companies that went public. And I'll show you what their revenue numbers and their operating income numbers were uh, in the years prior to their IPO. So the first examples of recurring revenue uh, uh, companies that I'll show, Uber and Lyft, right? So clearly recurring revenue, right? So, and I match this to the colors of the logos. So this is the Lyft data. The, dot, the dotted line is revenues. I've normalized the revenues of all the companies so that we, we normalize, we basically divide all the numbers every year by the revenue three years prior to IPO, right? So, you know, $1 of revenue became about $3 of revenue, which then became about $6.5 of revenue uh, over the next two years for Lyft. This was the trajectory for Uber. And this is the pattern that we see for um, oper like operating income scaled by the operating income uh, at the start of the sample, so three years prior to the IPO. So we don't necessarily always see increasing losses, but we do see these losses are, um, oh, you can't see this from this chart, but if you actually go look at the data set that I provide, again, all of this data is also found in the spreadsheet that I give. So for instance, this is, um, this will be other recurring revenue, right? So I have data on Lyft and Uber, and we can see what the losses are. I mean, the losses for Lyft and Uber were enormous prior to IPO, right? The year before IPO, close to a billion dollar loss, operating loss for uh, Lyft, and over three billion for Uber, right? So they're making large losses. There isn't much evidence that the losses are getting smaller, and what we'll see actually is when we average things out across all these recurring revenue businesses, on average, the losses are getting larger. It's not always true on a case-by-case -case basis, but on average for these companies, just like we saw with SaaS companies, we see that the losses get larger over time. So this is what we see with Uber and Lyft. Now I'm just gonna quickly show you some additional data points of other prominent recurring revenue companies. So we've got the e-commerce company Wayfair, right? So Wayfair also, you know, growing revenue, but substantial losses that you know, both two years and one year before the IPO are larger than what the losses were three years before the IPO. Same thing with Spotify, right? Increasing revenues, but increasing losses. If we look at Twitter, by the way, so Twitter had so much revenue growth in uh, between two years and one year before its IPO that I just, because I wanted to keep the scaling relatively relatively small. This literally extends beyond to like 12. Uh, but so you can see tw Twitter, like explosive revenue growth, uh, substantial losses. So one of the reasons why the losses fall for Twitter 
uh, even though it grows spectacularly, it grows about 300% in the minus one to uh, minus two to minus one year prior to the IPO. Uh, we're going to see a little bit later on, it's going to make sense when we build our financial model, is that Twitter more so than a lot of other recurring revenue companies, they got a lot of their customer acquisition and as a result revenue growth through viral customer acquisition as opposed to paid customer acquisition. And one of the things that we're going to see is this pattern of increasing losses. We're gonna explicitly see, see this with, um, with examples and examples. These increases, increasing losses come because you have to pay for customer acquisition. If you don't have to pay for customer acquisition, you don't expect to see this pattern. Because Twitter was able to acquire so many users without necessarily paying to acquire the users, through virality instead of uh, a, a paid growth channel, they don't quite have as much of this kind of increasing loss over time. So it's useful to kind of think about some of these things. And again, we'll highlight them via specific example. But my point is to show you the generality of the patterns that I'm highlighting. Um, up to date, I've shown you guys companies that went public. I figured I would also throw in the example of uh, the Wii company, which obviously didn't go public, but it did file for an IPO. If you look in the three years prior to we uh, filing its IPO, uh, this was what was happening to its operating losses. Right? So, uh, and if we, you know, when we think about the we company, we think of it as a company, it was growing extremely rapidly. It is a recurring revenue business because it acquires uh, a member. It hopes to keep the member on a, on a per period basis for an extended period of time. But another thing that we know about the Wii company is that their cost of customer acquisition was extremely high. And that's why we see this particularly pronounced pattern of increasing losses, you know, more, more dramatic than the other recurring revenue companies that we see. But if we take the, this kind of broader average of recurring revenue companies, we see a similar pattern to what we saw with the SaaS companies, right? High growth, but you know, substantial losses that are growing on average over time. And we want to make sense of that, right? And you know, one of the things that this also highlights is like some of the simple things that we might be tempted to do sometimes when we want to, for instance, value a company are going to be very problematic if we apply these kind of simple traditional rules to forecasting and valuing for, um, uh, for these types of businesses, right? So what's like the simplest rule that we could do to try to forecast cash flows, forecast profits for, uh, for a company and then, and then to value the company is we could just take a look at a company's cash flows and just extrapolate the company's cash flows over time, right? So look, what was the historical growth rate of cash flow growth or of operating income? And let's assume that that rate is going to persist over time, right? That's the simplest thing. And for a lot of companies, that's often what we start with when we're building our financial model. Now doing that makes sense in the, company, in the context of a company that's profitable and has pretty consistent growth over time. But we can see if we apply this rule for this type of company, right, an average SaaS company, we get a nonsensical answer, right? Because we have negative cash flow right now, negative operating income that number is becoming more negative over time. A simple extrapolation just gives you a nonsensical answer. It tells you, look, the company has negative value. And what we're, gonna, what we're gonna see when we build our financial model is if we think more carefully about the customer level economics of these businesses and the rate at which these businesses acquire users, um, we can build an alternative approach to doing our forecasting and valuation that's going to be able to forecast this type of pattern, right? Growing losses initially, but that will eventually in a kind of fully rigorous and logical way, eventually start flipping towards positive numbers. And as a result, be able to explain why a company like this would actually A, have um, positive value, and would also explain why we might actually see those companies grow a lot in value over time, right? So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna basically build um, 
uh, build a model that allows us to make sense of those, you know, I think fairly unique. And I think for, at least for me, the first time that I was carefully analyzing recurring revenue businesses, like I thought a lot of the patterns that I was seeing didn't make sense, right? But we're gonna be, so in particular, when I saw this pattern for SaaS companies, I first saw this when I was developing a, a venture capital course. And so when I saw this, I was trying to understand, well, why, would, why can these companies go public if their losses are becoming, you know, are, are already large and becoming more pronounced over time? Like, why does that make sense from a fundamental standpoint? One of the things we're gonna get out of uh, our discussion of the mechanics of forecasting uh, and valuation for these types of companies is we're gonna be able to explain why this pattern occurs and why these companies can still be valuable and desirable IPO targets. Again, my view is because both SaaS and recurring revenue are gaining an increasing share in the economy over time, this is something that you guys want to be intimately familiar and comfortable with going forward. Because having solid, rigorous skills for valuing these types of companies, it's important currently, but it's going to grow in importance going forward. Right? So I think it's worthwhile to really invest in getting comfortable in this topic. It's also a topic that you don't necessarily, like you don't often see covered in typical finance courses. So like if you think about like teaching finance, for some reason or another, covering this as a, as a, as a topic is something that's uh, been lagging a little bit um, in academia. So hopefully you guys will find uh, this stuff uh, useful. Um, anyway, so I think this is my essentially motivation for the stuff we're gonna do next. Oh, I will show you guys one other motivation here. Um, because the data that I've shown you so far, it's always been data before the IPO. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you data post IPO. So this is one year after IPO, one, two years after the IPO, three years after the IPO, and four years after the IPO. Um, I'm not showing you the data here on revenues. Just trust me when I say the revenues of these companies are growing generally fairly quickly post IPO. That's a pretty standard empirical observation for companies post IPO, they're still high growth when they go public. The only thing I'm showing you here is what's happening to operating income for three, post IPO for three different types of companies. The black line is the traditional software. So here specifically, I, I, just, I just included three traditional software companies in the years after they went public. Microsoft, which I had shown before. And then I also included uh, Oracle and Adobe. I did include a, a Oracle and Adobe for the pre-IPO example that I showed in that first tale of two companies uh, slides, just because I wasn't able to find their IPO prospectuses. So that's the reason why their data wasn't there previously. But I have included it here because I wanted to show more data points as opposed to less data points. So that you know, this real world data, you guys can have some faith that you know, I'm not cherry picking an individual example, that it's actually representative. Right, so if you looked at like traditional software, oh, I see that I have a typo here. Um, but if we look at uh, traditional software, right, you know, in, in the age where it was, per, you know, software companies selling perpetual licenses, right, what we saw is companies were profitable when they went public and their profits would continue to grow post going public. Um, but what we see is for SaaS companies, that's this kind of copper-ish color. And other recurring revenue, that's this yellow uh, line. In the four years after, they continue to lose money and, they, um, uh, and their losses are actually growing larger over time. So these companies here, the copper line for the SaaS, I took all the companies for the, from the, uh, um, I think I took every company that was in the uh, Bessemer Venture Pro, uh, uh, Partners Emerging Cloud Index, out of the companies that went public in 2015, 2016, because that would be the recent companies where we would have at least four years of data to work with. So that's why I picked those companies. And then the yellow other recurring revenue, I think has Wayfair um, and Twitter, which were included in the pictures I showed earlier. 
I also included Amazon in here. Uh, I didn't include Amazon in my examples for other recurring revenue company because Amazon went public during the dot-com bubble. And so actually Amazon went public so quickly that it didn't have three years of data before it went public. So that's, I'm just giving you guys a sense of why, like where the data comes from and, and what I include and why so that you guys can feel confident again that the data I show you is not misleading. So I see a couple of questions. Um, 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 maybe I'll take, I, I don't know who put up their hand first, so I'm sorry about that. But Dakota, you had a question? Uh, you might explain this later on. I was just about why these companies experience operating losses so quickly. Yeah. So, uh, so I will, like, we will literally build yeah. that rigorously in a financial model. And before we actually do that, I'm going to give you that simple nutshell intuition very shortly. Because okay. the intuition is actually pretty simple. Um, and then the, you know, building the model is about building a really fully rigorous, logical financial model that captures that, uh, that insight and observation. Okay. So we will get to it, I, I promise. And that's, you know, the answer to that question and understanding and knowing how to build that into model, like that's the most important kind of tools, financial modeling takeaway to get out of this whole topic. It's the most okay. important thing. So All right. There's obviously been a like change in mindset between these traditional companies. I'll, I'll ask later. Okay. So yeah, let's, uh, let's defer that. But I think definitely the perception of this stuff has changed. There's a lot of interesting things to discuss there. So absolutely. But let's defer to after we kind of are comfortable with the mechanics. Uh, Bruce, you had a question? Yeah, I was wondering if the companies has negative operating income before IPO. So how are we gonna value them like, like IPO price? Like so, so again, like once we build the financial model, we will, we will have answered your question. Okay. So, so like, Right now is just motivation and having you guys understand patterns in the real world. Okay. The next part of this part of the lecture and, or this part of the topic is all about putting math behind some fundamentals of these businesses to actually build a model that allows us to understand why this pattern happens and how we value the company and why those companies have positive value right now. So okay. absolutely, like just to reiterate, that's the most important thing from a tool standpoint for you guys to get out of this part of the topic, no doubt. Um, Esteban? Yeah, I think you answer already the question because I was about to ask the same. I mean, I was just going to ask like, are these companies after the IPO using the same strategy of increasing the customer acquisition? But I guess that's something you will explain later. Yeah, yeah. And we'll also talk about when it's a good idea to be really aggressive with customer acquisition versus when it's not. And we'll really zone in to the root of how to answer that question. Um, so that's what, I mean, you guys, are, like, all the que like all the three questions so far are really intimately related to each other. And the fact that you guys are asking yourselves this question I mean, again, I think a lot of it has to do with like thinking about things as simple extrapolation. You see a company where this is happening and, you know, I think a lot of people, right, would react to this and be like, holy shit, this company is terrible, right? And if it's terrible, why should it have large value right now? By the way, uh, if you look at this yellow line, the reason why this yellow line goes down so much, interesting story, this line goes down tremendously because of Amazon. So the, the one data point in this whole figure that pushes to increasing losses the most is Amazon. And think about how valuable Amazon was at this time and eventually became, right? So, um, so we really want to understand that in a rigorous way. How do, we, how do we make sense of companies like this that look like this in recent history that are likely to look like this over the next few years? And how do we justify positive values for that and pin that down in a precise way? That is the goal of, um, of what, we'll be, uh, what we'll be building in, in this part of the topic.
So Amin, I think, uh, was the last uh, question. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know what companies were included for that yellow line. Okay, yeah, so for the yellow, so by the way, every, I tried to be relatively transparent. All of this stuff, the data is included in the spreadsheet I provided. And I tried to label my sheets, right? So this SaaS pre-IPO, traditional software pre-IPO, those were the data for my first set of figures. Um, other recurring revenue pre-IPO, that was when I showed Wayfair, Uber, so on and so forth. That data comes from here. Um, SaaS post IPO, right? As I said, this was uh, the um, um, uh, the companies that I 2015 2016. Uh, the traditional software, as I had said, was Microsoft, Oracle, Adobe, and then the other one were uh, Amazon, Wayfair, and Twitter are the three companies I put. I basically what I did is I took the companies that I had from this tab, but only included the ones where I had at least four years of data. And then I figured I would also include Amazon because Amazon is probably the most prominent example of e-commerce recurring revenue that we can think of. So, that's so, Twitter, so Twitter was, a, was an exception since uh, it, ha it didn't have a negative operating income. It had a positive one. Well, it did. No, no. It had negative it was operating growing, income. But it, but it but was it, growing. But it was, it was shrinking. Uh, yeah. So like its, its losses were shrinking, you can see. Yeah. It, went, you know, it increased, but then it shrank even though it grew tremendously. And but that's, that's because it got, it got almost all of its growth for free because yeah. it just had spectacular viral customer acquisition. By the way, another example where you don't see this, this pattern is actually Facebook. So Facebook is an example of a recurring revenue company that actually didn't have losses before it went public. But again, we're, we're gonna see. The reason why this negative thing happens is because to get a customer, you have to pay sales and marketing expenses to get the customer, right? And when those costs are very small, the negative pull on profitability is not substantial. So it's really only for companies that grow fast, but have to pay for that growth. Uh, Twitter was you know, less of that, which is why it doesn't have that. I mean, I just wanted to point that out because this looked like a little bit of a counter example relative to what I had been saying earlier. Uh, but I still wanted to include it in my data just so that this figure would look somewhat representative, right? I didn't want to just cherry pick examples. So are folks okay with this? Anyway, I've, hopefully, hopefully I've, uh, I've uh, explained why we should care about that stuff and why it's interesting um, to actually think about how we want to do financial modeling and valuation for these types of companies. Now, in a nutshell, the difference the modeling difference and the thing that's going to be unique about recurring revenue uh, business models is about the customer level economics. So as I said, traditional business model, again, think Microsoft, um, Oracle, um, and, um, uh, and Adobe uh, when, when they initially went public. These were companies selling perpetual licenses, right? So when you think about acquiring a customer, it's really a one-shot transaction. You have to pay marketing expenses to get the customer. But once you get the customer, they pay you a one-time um, sales from the transaction. You probably have some one-time costs associated with that as well, right? But in some sense, right, that customer generates, roughly speaking, a one-time cash flow. If that is a good customer to have, that cash flow better be positive, right? If you're only gonna interact with a customer once and you lose money from them right away, that's obviously not a good business. But if it's a good business, you're making money every time you get a customer. And so as a result, the more customers you get, the more profits you make over time, right? So that's a traditional business model. And that's why we saw this pattern earlier, right? So profits getting larger and larger for the traditional business model, because for every customer they're getting, which is generating this growth, they're immediately generating a profit from that customer. So that's super intuitive, right? It makes, it makes sense, I think, for all of us, right? The thing that's different in a very important way for a recurring revenue business is when you think about the companies 
the recurring revenue businesses uh, operating profit or loss, it's combining two things. It's combining the profits that the company is making on a recurring basis from customers that it acquired in the past. Because the company, the customers that it acquired in the past and that it um, has kept are still paying you know, still paying money to the company, right? So that creates operating profits, but there's an offsetting factor that also shows up in operating income, which is the company at the same time needs to pay customer acquisition costs, sales and marketing expenses, for instance, for the new customers that it's acquiring, right? So when you look at operating income, for a recurring revenue business, there's two factors, one positive and one negative. There's the profits from past customers that are still customers, and there's the losses from paying sales and marketing and other customer acquisition costs for the new customers that you got today, but that aren't paying you yet or are only paying you slowly over time for being your customer. Does that make sense? Now let's think about those two dueling factors. If you have very few customers in the past and you're acquiring a ton of customers today and those customers are expensive to acquire, which of the two factors is gonna dominate? The positive or the negative? It's gonna be the negative, right? And so what that tells you is the larger your customer acquisition, total customer acquisition costs are, the more likely you are to have the losses offsetting the gains from your past um, recurring customers. And so the more likely you are to see this negative pattern. So when does this negative pattern happen? It happens when your customer acquisition costs for new customers more than offsets your marginal profits from your past acquired customers. When does that happen? It happens when you have to pay a lot to acquire a customer and when you're acquiring a lot of customers, right? So you don't see this if, uh, if you acquire customers slowly. So you don't see this for low growth recurring revenue companies, right? Professor, could, could you repeat that again? Uh, the negative uh, pattern? Yeah, so actually, and I'll also highlight where it's written on the slide. Um, Right, so, um, so it's written in the slide uh, 14 here, right, it says, so what I say is for recurring revenue businesses, cash flow and operating income at time T is equal to the current period profit from customers acquired before time T, right? So when you're looking at your operating income, some of it is the revenue that comes from the customers you've already acquired that are paying you for the software, for instance, or paying or are giving you recurring uh, business. Yes? We agree with that? So that's like a positive, right? If this is a good customer, whatever the cost of servicing them is, is gonna be lower than what they're paying you. So think of it as a marginal profit from your past customers. That's the positive. The negative in operating income is that you pay money, sales and marketing for instance, to acquire new customers. And the thing with acquiring the new customer is you have to pay for them upfront, but they only start paying you slowly in the future. So you bear that cost now, but you're only going to recover that from them in the future, not right now. So if you look at operating income right now, the future benefits they give you don't show up there. Make sense? Right? And so the question is which of those two things is bigger? If the customer acquisition cost part is bigger, you're gonna be making losses. That's gonna happen when you grow quickly and when you have to pay a lot to acquire a customer, which is why we see that pattern. Is a lot of these recurring revenue businesses don't have the benefit of viral acquisition, where I think of viral as free, right? But they're growing quickly. And it's in those cases that you see losses and potentially losses that get bigger and bigger and bigger. There's another interesting thing, which is 
like if we compare this pattern with this one, loosely speaking, this is the pattern we see with a high growth SaaS company that has large customer acquisition costs. Meanwhile, this is the pattern we would see for an ultra high growth recurring revenue company that has important customer acquisition costs. So in other words, I mean, again, like if we were just extrapolating, this looks bad, but people seeing this for the first time would generally say this looks even worse. What we're actually going to see is so long as like the company eventually makes like on a present value basis, makes a profit from acquiring customers, it's going to turn out this company is actually worth more than this company. Right? So like to me, there's like a, a fair number of counterintuitive patterns with these types of businesses. But the logic is exactly what I said, right? It's you've got these two effects that show up in operating income. They also show up in cash flow, which is you get positive cash flow and operating income from past customers, but you get negative from the cost of acquiring new customers. And if the latter is bigger than the former, you get that loss and potentially increasing loss pattern. Even though it's a good sign because it means those losses are happening because you're successfully acquiring a lot of customers. And you know, if you benefit on a value basis from acquiring a customer, acquiring more customers is better than acquiring less customers, right? So now let's go and, you know, from like this simple intuition that I just explained to like actually getting comfortable with building a rigorous, um, um, operating income, revenue, cash flow model, and valuation model for these companies. Folks okay with us starting that now? So we're going to do it via a simple example at first. So what I've done is I've created a as simple of an example of this type of um, financial modeling exercise as I could. And I've made it simple by stripping out some elements of the cash flow equation. So the first example I'm going to do here, I'm going to assume that this company, it's not realistic, but it's just to make it easier to go through the model. I'm going to assume the company pays no taxes, has no capital expenditures, has no working capital. We're going to loosen all of these assumptions to make the example more realistic as we go through the extended versions of this example in part two of this topic. But for part one, I want to keep it simple so that we really zone into this intuition that I just highlighted about keeping track of customer acquisition costs versus rep of currently acquired customers versus, you know, marginal profits from previously acquired customers. Okay, so this example is going to do this in what I view to be the simplest way possible. Okay, so we're going to take this example, we're going to build a financial model off of this example that can be viewed as a template for valuing for, for forecasting and valuation in these types of companies sound good to folks it's always difficult to figure out whether something sounds good or not on zoom but i'll assume that no no one's complaining yet it doesn't look like people have dropped out so um okay so let's go through this examples so um and i've actually tried to make this example relatively representative of a typical um, a typical company a few years before it goes public that's a kind of a, a successful SaaS company. Sorry, does someone have a question? Oh, uh, by the way, so I see a question here. Lily says, how can we tell the effectiveness of customer acquisition? So Lily, that's a great question. That goes to the question of is customer acquisition good? We're gonna treat that as a valuation exercise, if you're okay. I will build the financial model first, and then I will highlight how we assess whether customer acquisition is value enhancing or not. So, but let's actually just kind of read through this problem. Um, and then I'll also explain, I, I tried to make this example like realistic. So I actually, a lot of the like parameters that I'm giving you guys here, I actually obtained from real world data. So I'll also explain where I got that data as well. 
because it can be helpful for you if you ever need to guess some of these parameters in practice, it gives you a sense of where you might be able to get uh, data to help you with this type of exercise. So the company that we're going to build a financial model for, it's a hypothetical company, but we'll refer to it as a high flying private, so it's not public yet, uh, SaaS startup. Um, I'm thinking of this as a company, it's like three years before it would go public. Um, that's going to be related to some of the data that I use to, to get uh, the numbers that I use in this example. Um, I'm going to assume this company currently, um, it's already acquired 256 users. Uh, 200, uh, it's an enterprise SaaS company, so its customers are, are corporations, not consumers. Um, so it's got 256 current customers. Uh, these were previously acquired, so prior to time zero, we sit at time zero right now. And it's just about to acquire another 192 customers. Uh, in particular, 192 is 75% of its existing customer base. So it's just, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of like saying it's a um, customer base is growing by 75% per year. So it's about to acquire 192 customers. And then I'm going to assume at time one and time two, it's also going to grow its customer base by another 75% per year. So we're gonna have three successive years of 75% growth. By the way, where did I get the 75%? This 75% was the average revenue growth rate for SaaS companies in the three years before the IPO from that SaaS sample. So that number, I actually tried to make it realistic by anchoring it to real world data. So that's where this number comes from. And then after it goes public, I'm gonna assume it grows its customer base by 40% per year for another four years. So at year three, year four, year five, and year six. Where do I get this 40%? I also get it from data. I got it from the Bessemer Venture Partners Emerging Cloud Index. I looked at those companies when they went public, what was their average growth rate post, uh, post uh, post IPO for the next four years, it was about 40%. So that's where I got that number as well. Um, I do make one unrealistic assumption here. Uh, it's for a practical uh, reason. We're gonna talk about relaxing this when we do our extended examples, but just to keep things relatively simple, I'm gonna assume for now, unrealistically, that after time six, there's no more customer acquisition, okay? Here, I'm not claiming to be realistic. Um, I'm just putting it there because it's gonna simplify our, um, our, our modeling spreadsheet. So this is telling us about customer acquisition, but in a recurring, for a recurring revenue uh, company, we also need to think about the customer cash flow dynamics, essentially. So we need to know at the customer level, how much money does a you know, an acquired customer generate every period, I'm going to assume each enterprise customer pays the SaaS company $200,000 per year. Now, this might sound like a big number, but for a SaaS company selling to large enterprise, this type of revenue per customer per year is actually pretty typical, by the way. So this is actually a fairly realistic number. So 200 k per year, in revenue on average from each customer. I'm gonna assume that these payments are paid at the end of the year. So you acquire a customer at time zero, they don't pay you that first 200K until time one. Okay, so that's an assumption I'm making here. There's also costs of servicing the customer of 150K per year, also paid at the end of the year. Just to give you guys a sense, um, I got this 150K by basically looking at the margins for typical SaaS companies. So typical margins are 25%. So you know, that means the cost is 75%. So 75% of 200 is 150. So that's where I got this number. One of the things I wanna highlight is I'm trying in good faith to pick realistic numbers. One of the, and one of the things that may be a little bit surprising is when we build our model, we'll get forecasts of cash flows that look very similar to what we see as you know, the average revenue and um, uh, operating income of these companies in the years before they go public. 
So this set of assumptions where I've carefully chosen each of these numbers is actually gonna generate very realistic predictions. So hopefully that convinces you guys that this is actually a useful exercise to do because it actually generates somewhat realistic numbers that, that, that seem to hold in real world data. Um, so this is per period. In this example, I'm gonna assume that there's no um, customer churn. So if you acquire a customer today, for simplicity, I'm gonna assume you keep the customer forever. But I'm also gonna assume that customers don't spend more every period when they stay as a customer, right? So one is like, when you put the two combined with each other, it allows you to get a metric called uh, the dollar retention rate. So you know, for customers acquired at time one, for every dollar they spent, do they spend the dollar next year on average? Or do they spend more or less than that? Because it gives you a sense of whether the profits you make from that customer is gonna be growing over time, declining over time, or staying steady. Here, I'm just assuming it's staying steady. We'll incorporate more realistic assumptions about churn in our extension examples as well. Um, then the final thing that I need to cover here for forecasting purposes is information on the customer acquisition cost. Um, I'm gonna assume that the average cost of acquiring one enterprise customer is $260,000. So on average, the company needs to pay 260K in various sales and marketing expenses to acquire one customer. That doesn't mean they spent the whole 260K on that customer, right? So for instance, if they had to pursue 100 different leads on average to get one customer, then this would basically say that for each lead, they were spending about $2,600, but 99 out of 100 times, they just didn't get out of it. Uh, they, 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 didn't, they didn't get a successful customer outcome out of this. So just keep in mind, when I talk about um, customer acquisition cost, it's the average cost in sales and marketing paid to get one paid customer where we roll in to that cost all the costs we pay that don't successfully lead to a customer. Like you have, obviously you have to include that uh, in order to get a proper sense of whether customer acquisition is uh, good or not. So I see some uh, questions in the chat bar here. Um, yeah, so um, these questions that are here, when I show the spreadsheet, it'll be pretty, it'll be much clearer exactly what I mean. I'm sorry if the wording isn't absolutely uh, uh, perfect. No one will ever mistake me for a, a, a perfect writer for sure. Um, the final thing that I'll need to point out for this is we want to build a model where we're going to forecast out revenue and operating income. Notice because of these assumptions, no taxes, no capital expenditure, no working capital, operating income is equal to cash flow. So I don't need to forecast cash flow here. Um, I can just do NPV on, op on, um, on operating income to get the value of the company in this stylized example. But in order to do that valuation, we need to have a discount rate. I'll assume a discount rate of 10%. Okay, so given this information, we now want to build both our forecasts and our valuation. So we'll talk about that now. So this is, um, this is all done in uh, the last sheet in the spreadsheet that I sent you, um, which is, you know, it's called simple example, and it, refer, you know, it refers to the hypothetical representative success company. Um, here, I just have the parameters that I stated in, in the prompt. prompt. Uh, I'm not going to discuss this today, but in my template, I actually allow for two discount rates. One is the discount rate to apply to the cash flows of a customer once you get a customer. And the other one is the discount rate to apply to customer acquisition or customer growth. Um, for now, we're going to assume that they're the same but it turns out my valuation template allows us to assume that those two factors in company cash flows have different levels of risk. And that might actually be realistic. Let's think of a stylized example, right? Let's say once you get a customer, no matter what, they stick with you forever. If you wanted to value the cash flows of the customer in that case, what discount rate should you use to value the customer cash flows? If they're going to stick with you forever, no matter what. 
and margins are going to stay constant, yada, yada. In that case, you'd want to value those cash flows at the uh, riskless rate, right? Because there's, there's no risk associated with that, right? So that once you get a customer, their costs and benefits should be valued at the riskless rate because there's no more risk associated at the customer level. But even if that were true, you shouldn't value the whole company at the riskless rate because maybe whether or not you get a lot or very little customers depends on whether the economy is doing well. So when you're thinking about valuing customer growth, so the increase in number of customers you have, you probably wouldn't want to use the riskless rate. You would want to use a higher discount rate to reflect the risk associated on, you know, you tend to get more customers when the economy is doing well, for instance. Right, so you may want to distinguish between the riskiness of cash flows once you get a customer and the riskiness of actually acquiring new customers. Generally, we think that the riskiness of cash flows once you get a customer is lower than the risk of getting new customers. It, it turns out that's one of the reasons why um, SaaS companies and recurring revenue companies tend to have higher multiples than, um, than, um, than, than traditional businesses. It's because that recurring revenue basically lo effectively lowers the discount rate because the customers you already have, you should value their cash flows at the riskless rate. Um, again, if this doesn't make perfect sense, we can discuss it a little bit later. Uh, I just wanted to point out that I've got two discount rates. This is the discount rate to use once you get a customer, and this is the discount rate to use um, for thinking about customer growth. Um, Again, for now, I'm, I'm making the two numbers the same. Um, this was you know, 200K, uh, so everything is in units of thousands, 200K revenue per period once you have a customer. The margin is 25%, that's obtained from real world data. If you wanna see that data, you can actually look at the BVP Emerging Cloud Index data. Um, that's where I got this number. Um, yeah, so. 25% margin, so 70, you know, one minus 25% is 75%, 75% of 200, that's where this number comes from. Um, take the difference between this number and this number, that's where the 50 comes from. So once you have a customer, they're generating 50K in marginal profit every period. And I'm assuming that the uh, cus customer acquisition cost per dollar of revenue per period is 1.3. So that means for, like, if you make $200,000 in revenue per period uh, from a customer, you need to pay 1.3 times that, um, which is 260 per, uh, to acquire the customer. So that's where those numbers came from, by the way. In my spreadsheet, anything that's denoted as red in the parameters was obtained from real world data, and the blue ones aren't obtained from real world data. This is just kind of anecdotally at roughly the right level for uh, uh, companies that sell to large enterprise, um, the 10%, I didn't try to calibrate in any precise way. Uh, and the final parameter that's not in the parameter list is the um, size, of, like the, is the amount of customers I have at the beginning of time zero before I acquire the batch of 192 customers. Um, this number I picked just to anchor revenue at time zero at about 50 million, which was the number that we had for the average SaaS company in my sample, right? So this number was picked basically to match the first data point in my original graph. So I'm going back to this. Uh, I picked 256 to get me at roughly this level, okay? Um, sorry go back to the spreadsheet. Okay, so now I've, I've explained the parameters. Now I want to explain the model. Um, and the first thing I want to do is I want to explain the most important difference between how we build the model, our, our financial model for recurring revenue business, um, like that differs from what we would do with like a normal financial model for a traditional business model. And the main difference is that we undertake something called a cohort analysis. So rather than lumping all customers together, we separate our customers 
between the customers we've already acquired, that's in column D here, right? So we've already acquired 256 customers. And we're gonna separate that with the customers that we're just about to acquire, right? So these are past customers. There's the customers that we're just about to acquire at time zero. Remember I said there was 192 of them. Then there's the customers we forecast acquiring at time one, time two, time three. In our specific example, we stopped acquiring customers at time six. I just put 10 columns to allow for 10 periods of customer acquisition. Okay, but just keep in mind, and this is key to the model, is I'm in, in building my model, rather than trying to go straight to revenue and straight to operating income and straight to cash flow, I disaggregate by cohort. So I keep track of when I acquired customers, right? Past company customers, customers about to be acquired, customers acquired in a year, yada, yada, yada. Why do I do this? First reason that I do it is actually forecasting operating income um, um, for these individual cohorts is actually extremely easy. So it's an, it's an easy sub step to do in our financial model, right? If we think about our past customers, there's 256 of them. As I said, I assume they stay customers forever and they're generating a profit per period of 50 every period forever. So what that means is, right, right now, they're just about to send us this period's check of 200, we'll pay 115 cost. So for each of these customers, we're gonna generate an, an operating income or a profit, a marginal profit, of uh, $50,000. And that number is gonna be the same every period because we don't lose any of the customers, but the customers don't spend less or more. So far so good, pretty straightforward, right? Notice these numbers are all positive. But this isn't, right, so for instance, if we look at time zero, we're just about to get a check of about $12.8 million from this customer. Uh, sorry, it's not a check. It's like the, the check itself would be $51 million, right? Which is 200,000 times 256. But the profit we make from that check um, on a marginal basis, given the 150 in cost, is gonna be 12.8 million. So far, so good. But we also has, have losses. Remember what I said? There's this balance between, you know, the positive factor, marginal profits from past customers, and a cost, the cost of acquiring the new customers that we're getting. Well, that's reflected in cohort at time zero, right? Cohort at time zero, at time zero, to get those 192 customers, we need to pay 260 per customer, 260,000. So actually to acquire those 192 customers, we have to pay almost $50 million. So notice the negative offsets the positive here. And that gives us a net operating income of minus 37 million, right? So notice this number is just the sum of the operating income across all cohorts. Make sense? So notice this is how I'm breaking up the problem. I have a column for each cohort. I can lump all of my past cohorts into one column because all of the past cohorts, I'm not paying any customer acquisition costs that cost was paid in the past, right? Uh, and then if we look at the cohort at time zero, at time one, well, now we don't pay any more customer acquisition costs because we've already acquired them and we get a profit of 50, marginal profit of 50,000 per 192. And so then we get 9.6 million from this group, right? So notice, and basically what I'm saying is the past cohort, it's just a perpetuity of, cash, of, of profits. Cohort at time zero, we pay something for it today, but then it generates a perpetuity thereafter. What about cohort at time one? Well, 
the cohort that we're gonna acquire in one year generates no profits today because it hasn't been acquired yet. In a year, it's gonna cost us money because we have to pay 260K for each of these 336 customers. By the way, where does the 336 come from? It's 75% of the existing customer base. Right, so notice in this column here, so if we look, um, sorry, this row here, notice I take last period's customer base and add this period's customer acquisition, right? And in this column here, I take percentage growth rate times last period's customer base. So this is just keeping track in these two rows here, is just keeping track of how many customers do I acquire every period and how does my customer, my aggregate customer uh, base change on a per period basis as well? Because that's where these numbers came from. Um, right, same thing, cohort two, right? I get nothing for two periods. When I acquire them, I lose a bunch of money, 153 million roughly, which was 588 times a 260K. And then, Thereafter, from this cohort, I'm getting 50K times 588, which is 29.4 million. Right, so you notice, like, for our future cohorts, you see this thing that looks like a triangle of zeros, because those are like, you know, the period of time before you ever acquire the customers. But notice each individual column is really simple. Right? And then once we've got our cohort level operating income numbers, all we do is we aggregate across all cohorts to get our overall operating income, right? So minus 37, right? So according to this model, our operating income is what? Minus 37 million followed by minus 65 million, followed by minus 114 million. Then notice actually the losses fall a little bit the next period. Why do they fall? Because our growth rate fell, right? So when our growth rate fell, we don't lose quite as much, but then as our growth rate stays constant at 40, we start to lose more and more and more. And then once we stop customer growth, we get positive cash flows. We get positive cash flows because once we've stopped customer acquisition, we pay zero in customer acquisition costs. So we only have the positive from the revenue, the marginal profits of past customers, and we get none of the negative from customer acquisition. Does that make sense? But, right, so this gives us our, I mean, this is basically our model, right? This is our forecast of operating, um, operating income. Again, it's not, this example isn't perfectly realistic because I don't have the other components of the cash flow equation. I also shut down customer growth starting time seven, right? So we're gonna add realism to this spreadsheet and the model um, uh, in future examples. But the thing that I want us to be comfortable right now is this discipline of being organized and separating everything by cohort. And realizing our forecasts within each cohort are very straightforward. All we need to do, do the easy thing by cohort, then sum it up to get the overall for the company. And when we see what the overall for the company looks like, we do get a pattern that looks like what we had sh shown with real world data, right? The cash flows are negative, sorry, the uh, operating income, which is in this example because of the assumptions on tax, capex, and working capital, the same thing as cash flow, um, are negative and becoming more negative. They continue to be negative and persist even after three years, right? So think of this, this is three years before the IPO. This is after the IPO, it still stays negative for a while, but then eventually it becomes positive. And because it eventually becomes positive, that explains why the company has positive value because it's losing money now, but it, the fact that it's losing money now, now is a sign that they're gonna make profits in the future because those losses today are coming from acquiring customers that'll keep giving you benefits into the future. We can also do our, our revenue forecast, 
right? Our revenue forecast, all we need to do is take our customer base from the previous period, right? So at time zero, we'd look at our customer base from time minus one, and we multiply that by 200K because all the customers that we had a period ago are now sending us a check for 200K right now. Same thing, what would be our revenue at time one? It would be our customer base at time zero after we acquire our new batch of customers, right? So the 256 plus 192, which is 448, right? So that means right now, after we acquire our new customers, we have 448 customers. And next year, right, which is the end of this period, they're going to all, all send us $200,000 for use of our software, let's say. And that means 89 million. And then, yeah, it's the same principle over and over again. The 784 customers that we have at time one generate 200,000 each at time two, so on and so forth. So does that seem relatively straightforward? Right, so notice like really the only thing that we've added to like a typical model you guys would build, in particular, this is a bottom up model, right? Because we're forecasting out our customer acquisition and we're looking at all the sources of revenue, expenses, and later on cash flows at each customer level, right? This is a bottom up type analysis. Um, um, but you know, the only thing that's different relative to you know, a bottom up analysis that you might do in another context is that we've actually broken it down by cohort, right? Um, and again, the reason is each cohort is easy to analyze, but notice you get a pretty complex pattern of profits when you aggregate across the cohorts. And again, it generates those patterns that we saw earlier. And notice like the numbers we're getting are remarkably similar to the numbers that I showed you from the real world. And what I wanna highlight is this is not like a mechanical matching, right? I made some like basic parameter assumptions from one sample of data and then I show you that the predictions are giving us very similar numbers to another, to another sample of data. So hopefully that gives you a sense that this model is legit, right? Because again, right, think revenue, 51, 90, 156. We look at the, we look at this data, 51, 90, 100, it's about the same. 156, this is maybe 160 something. I mean, it's remarkably close and it's not a mechanical match. So it's generating realistic, uh, realistic predictions. Um, and same thing, if we look at the losses, minus, you know, this is like minus 40 roughly, minus 60, minus 100. Let's look at the numbers we got. Minus 37, minus 65, minus 110, right? It's, it's actually matching the pattern that we showed pretty nicely. Now, a couple of other things that I'm going to, okay, I think this is what I'm gonna do. The last thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do valuation of the company in this spreadsheet. Um, and then what we're gonna do in tomorrow's lecture, we're gonna start the lecture by doing a bit of sensitivity analysis on this spreadsheet so that we can understand some of the qualitative factors that lead to higher valuations and changes in the pattern of revenue and operating income. And then after we kind of play with this template a little bit, we'll extend the template to make it more realistic, right? To add CapEx, taxes, working capital, and maybe make some more realistic assumptions about customer dynamics. Sound good? All right, so there's actually, there's two ways we can do valuation for this startup. Um, one only works when we assume the discount rate for valuing customer cash flows is the same as the discount rate for customer growth. That's the case in this example because I said 10% discount rate no matter what. Um, the first valuation I'm going to do is going to be, uh, is going to be correct whenever that's true. Um, 
this valuation is not going to be correct if those two discount rates are not the same. The second valuation I'm going to do is going to be general and is going to allow the two discount rates to differ from each other. But maybe I'll explain the details of that second valuation uh, in tomorrow's lecture. But the first thing I want to do is just do the basic valuation, assuming that, you know, for both within customer and for customer growth, uh, we use a 10% discount rate. Well, all we have to do is DCF the cash flows. Again, operating income here is cash flows because of the assumptions I made on tax, CapEx, and working capital, right? So what do we do? We just take NPV using our 10% discount rate of the cash flows starting at time one. I take the cash flows starting at time one all the way up to time 10. Then what I do is I add my, my cash flow at time zero. That's just because of the way the NPV function works in Excel, you know, it's defined so that the first cash flow you enter is a time one, not a time zero. So you always manually input the time zero cash flow. And then what I want to do is add a terminal value because this cope, uh, right, the company is going to keep on generating cash flows equal to 263 million per year in perpetuity um, starting at, um, uh, starting at, uh, well, continuing at time 11, 12, 13. So that's just a normal perpetuity. So all I have to do is take cash flow at time 11 or operating income at time 11, which is this number here, because there's no growth by assumption in our model. And then just, you know, use perpetuity formula. So divide by our discount rate of 10%. So that's where I get cell C31, right? And then what I want to do is I want to take that terminal value you guys have done these things, I think, with Vadim already, and just discount that by my discount rate as well, back to time zero. So I take the terminal value at time 10 and discount it at the discount rate for 10 periods. Okay, so that's what I did here. That gives me a value. It gives me a value of $966 million. So in this example, this company, which is about to lose $37 million, then will lose 65, then will lose 113 and I'll be losing money for an extended period of time, we've rationalized an almost $1 billion valuation for this company. By the way, in the real world, if this was a more realistic example, the valuation would actually be higher than a billion dollars because we would still expect some customer growth after seven years. I just, for simplicity, made it zero. So this is, if anything, a lowball estimate on value. So this is one way for us to do the valuation is add up all the operating income or the cash flow numbers by cohort and do an NPV of those aggregated operating income numbers. Another way that we can do this is instead of aggregating operating income, then doing NPV, we can take the disaggregated operated income numbers. So the operating income numbers by cohort, do an NPV of that, then add up the NPV of all the cohorts. Right? So this number here is the NPV at time zero of just our past cohorts. So if we do an NPV of getting 12.8 million right now, 12.8 in a year, and then 12.8 every single year, that's how I got this number of about 140 million. Right? So out of this 966 million, 140 million of that comes from the customers we already have. Yes, Amin, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, I raised my hand a little bit before. I was just, well, I just wanted to ask you. Uh, so the growth has an impact on whether you have uh, negative uh, operating income, not the IPO. I was just asking about how would the IPO have that have that effect? Uh, how would the would so how the IPO would have what effect? Uh, the effect of stopping the negative operating income and uh, oh, and. Uh, uh, okay, so couple of things I want to point out. Um, so you'll notice these numbers are negative and then they become positive and steady. That's not realistic. So this is a part of the model that I don't want us to over-focus on because it's not perfect. I, and the reason why this number is becoming positive all of a sudden, this number goes from negative to positive here precisely because growth stopped. What happens yeah. when growth stops? Remember, operating income is a tug of war between two things. The profits from past customers, 
and the cost of acquiring new customers, right? Well, if you acquire no customers, it's not a tug of war. It's like one side pushes and there's no one on the other side. So you just have the positive and none of the negative. So of course the number is going to be positive. So the reason why this number is suddenly becoming positive that quickly is because we just unrealistically shut down growth completely. Yeah. You wouldn't see as sharp of a pattern if instead of having no growth, right? So what I'm assuming here is 75% growth for three periods, 40% growth for four periods, and then zero after. So let's say we made it 10% instead. I have this spreadsheet is set up as a template. So I can just push this and notice these numbers have changed a little bit now. Now, because the growth rate fell dramatically, it did shift from negative to positive. So that's what you see with these recurring revenue businesses is once, they're, once their growth rate falls, that's when they start generating a lot of profit because they're reaping the spoils from the past and not paying any more sales and marketing for the future. Yeah, I just wanted to know if in real life, uh, a company's IPO would have an impact on the on the customer growth would it uh, stop so, it so that i mean look the most realistic model generally what happens is is your your growth rate is gradually following following okay so Good. i've had it fall in two stages from 75 percent in the three years before ipo to 40 percent in the four years after to zero forever afterwards right i have three phases of growth here um but um but you could even you could have you know you could specify growth in a different way. You could have annual growth where it gradually falls over time, right? So we could make different choices here. Okay, thanks. Make sense? Yeah. Um, Did you, I, notice, I, so, I had, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I had two questions. So like here, if we want to determine the IPO price, would we use the NPV at time bill like, divided by the number of share we're going to issue? Yeah, so that's, that a, that's a very... That's a very good question, right? So, um, so what Bruce is asking is right now, this valuation, 966 million, given our assumptions, that's the value of the company right now, while the company is still private and I'm assuming three years away from an IPO. So if we wanted to find out what the IPO price, what we currently expect the IPO price to be in three years, Bruce, you're 100% correct. We would do an NPV as of time three. So again, the question is whether you want to treat this as sunk at time three or not. But let's say like the 74 million in loss is already, has already happened when we do the IPO. Then we would do the NPV of this. This would be discounted now by one period instead of four periods because we're three years in the future. This would be discounted by two periods. Actually, why don't we go ahead and do that? So th I'll be able to do this really quickly. So I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna call this um, NPV, NPV at time three um, after, um, so I'm gonna call this post loss. What that means is the IPO happens just after this loss occurred, okay? So then what would we expect the IPO price to be? It would be NPV of our 10%, um, all of these numbers. And then, okay, so this is, um, I think this is seven, this would now be seven periods later. So then terminal value discounted by, again, our 10%. But now at time three, time 10 is seven periods later. Boom. So this gives us a valuation of 1.6 billion, right? So given our model, our estimate is if the company goes public in three years, we would expect it to go public at about a $1.6 billion valuation. Again, this model is a little bit unrealistic because we would expect some growth thereafter. So let's say we assume like thereafter 10, 10%. When I say thereafter here, let me clarify, that's growth from time eight through 10. So 
even when we change this number, growth 10 periods and beyond is still going to be zero. Um, but that gives us you know, a substantially different valuation. Uh, but this is how we would get this is how we would get the IPO price. And notice, I mean, this is all common framework, right? It's just where, uh, and the big caveat is, this price is only true to the extent that these forecasts prove to be correct, right? Uh, yeah, someone else had a question, Esma? Uh, yeah, I, I still have a question. Sorry. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so, I, I, like, it's about timing of IPO, so, here the assumption is like the firm can grow their customer base seven seventy five percent for three years and forty percent like thereafter. But yeah. the thing is, if we don't do our IPO, the company may not have enough capital to maintain that forty percent like customer growth, right? So in the real world, uh, my question I guess would be like, what is the perfect timing for these comp startups to do our IPO and make sense to them? Um, okay, so that actually, that's a very good question. This actually touches on a couple of themes. That's actually, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate them because this is actually important to know, especially for recurring revenue businesses. Because one thing you notice with recurring revenue business, so I hope everyone follows this, they burn a shitload of money when they're doing well. Um, they need to be able to do that, meaning they need to have access to capital, right? And so, Absolutely, like sometimes you go public because you're burning so much money that the only way for you to be able to fund those losses, and you want to fund those losses because even though you're losing in the short term, the benefits you get in the long term more than offset. So these are kind of like good losses because these customers are valuable, right? Um, so yeah, if, if, if you forecast to get these really large losses and you're not able to raise that, that level of funds in the private market, or for some reason you prefer being public than private, then that justifies going public. So that can actually be precisely a reason why a company like this would go public is they need to raise the money to be able to cover their short-term losses. Right? So like financing for recurring revenue businesses is even more important than traditional businesses. Because traditional businesses, once things are going well, they should be making profits. And if they're making profits, they don't necessarily need to raise money. But these companies, even if they're doing something that's economically valuable, they can be burning money in the short term because their costs are front loaded, sales and marketing, and their benefits just kind of trickle over time. But one thing I will say, Bruce, is yep. the ability to raise large amount in private markets has dramatically expanded in the last decade. So you don't see necessarily quite as much of a rush to, to do an IPO by necessity because the only way for you to raise, this is 200, 145, this is about 450 million over those three years. Like, many like some companies are able to raise 450 million dollars in the private market right and, and so if you can raise in the private market that's not the sole reason to do an ipo okay right so um and there are some other like you know costs and benefits associated with like like choosing you know when do you ipo versus when do you raise large private rounds um i won't discuss that here right now because i'll discuss that a little bit in my vc course that i'm going to teach you guys um, but that's a, that's a, that's a, it's, it's good that you mentioned that because it, I, it's important to point out recurring revenue businesses, when they grow rapidly, lose a lot of money in the short term. It's not necessarily a bad sign, right? In fact, you know, losing a lot of money in short run is still worth almost a billion dollars, right? But it does mean you're valuable, but you must be able to raise financing or else you just can't do it. And so raising capital oftentimes is done because of the need to cover customer acquisition costs. And sometimes that, that justifies specifically doing an IPO, but sometimes you can raise that money in the private market. Um, Thank you. Esteban? No problem. Yeah, well, I have two questions. The first one is very simple. Uh, 
why you did the perpetuity from uh, time 10 and not or 11 and not from uh, time equals uh, seven because from seven we don't have any growth oh i, I mean i i could have done it from time seven and beyond right um I, I could have done it from time seven and beyond but i just decided to do it from time 10 and beyond so that i could have a slightly more flexible sp uh, spreadsheet that would allow me to change this number to like you know five percent and notice it then automatically changes it. Okay, perfect. And my yeah. second question is actually with regards of that. So when you put um, some growth, I guess maybe this was with the discussion with Bruce. So whenever there is more growth coming up in the next periods after uh, the IPO, that means that the net present value uh, will decrease, right? Just Sorry, I just received a text message because uh... One of my son's friends had a COVID test. It, so I just said that it was negative. So uh, what a relief um, uh, because my son hung out with him. Well, also because I care about my kid, but um, um, sorry. So I got distracted for a second. Well, not something I want on the Zoom video, but too late now. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, can you repeat that? Uh, yeah, of course, no problem. Um, so I was looking at the, at the numbers when you actually, um, put any number on the growth after uh, the period six. Yeah. Uh, that means that whenever there is growth after period six or, or like after the IPO, then the net present value of this will be lower, right? Because uh, they will have uh, more cost. Um, when this number is higher, when, okay. So actually, this actually goes back to Lily, uh, uh, wrote a question in the chat bar earlier saying, how can we tell the effectiveness of customer acquisition? Okay. So the best way to tell the effectiveness of customer acquisition is to look at the value of acquiring a customer. Now let's think about what, what the cash flows associated with a customer are, right? So you got time. Let's say you acquire the customer at time zero. Right, so what do you do? You pay 260,000 to acquire the customer, and then you receive 50 every year thereafter. Um, right, well, what's the present value of this customer? It's just the NPV of this stream of cash flows, right? Right, so what is that? It's just minus 260 plus the value of a perpetuity which is you get 50 in perpetuity at your discount rate of 10%. So notice the value of a cut, this is telling us the value of one customer. Every customer we acquire is worth $240,000 after we've netted out all the costs of getting the customer, the costs of servicing the customer, and the benefit every period of having that customer. So that gives us to the, the fact that this number is positive tells us that acquiring customers is good because every time we get a customer, it's kind of like someone just gave us 240,000. They didn't actually give us 240,000 right away. They kind of took 260 from us right now and then they give us 50 in perpetuity thereafter. But from a valuation standpoint, it's kind of like cutting us a check of 240. So this tells us growth is good. So how do you determine whether growth for a SaaS company or a recurring revenue company is good? You want to do this customer level NPV valuation. That, th there's actually a term for this. So doing this valuation, it's called doing unit economics or customer level economics. So this is a, it's a useful term to know because unit economics is a term that's used very commonly both in the startup VC world and in the SaaS recurring revenue for public companies world. When people say that, all they mean is do NPV at the customer level. When this number is bigger than zero, that means adding a customer adds value. And when this number is greater than zero, that means you wanna acquire as many customers as you can. 
And what that implies is whenever I increase any of these numbers, you will see this number go up. So let's just take a look at it. 75% to 80%, oh, the number went up. 40 to 45%, oh, the number went up. 0% to 2.5%, oh, the number went up, right? So when we increase growth, value went up in our valuation template and in our financial model, and that's precisely because this number was positive. Um, if this number was negative, you'd get the opposite, like this company would suck, because basically it's destroying, it's destroying value, right? It's business is, is as negative as opposed to positive economics. Okay, I, I understand. Yeah, it's, it's just that I, I guess because uh, you have on, in this model until t equals 10, then the, the last, probably the last ones are not uh, valued as to, to 40, but less because you, you cannot count oh. after t equals 10. Is it probably? Yeah, yeah. so, okay, so Esteban, now, so you're, you, so this is a great, this is also a very good question, right? So like, I'm assuming in this problem, the like unit economics of a customer are constant over time. And what you're saying is, well, after a while, it maybe becomes more and more difficult to acquire customers, right? Or maybe com competition comes in and lowers the margins that we can get, right? So all of those things I've simplified in my model by assuming they're constant. So I have my last slide in uh, this set of slides. I have this, air, this section that's called next steps, additional co considerations one of which is exactly as you say time varying margins for instance or time varying customer acquisition cost so you can try to factor that into your model as well we didn't do it here because i wanted to just focus on the most important basics of this problem the most important basics were always tackling this as a cohort analysis problem separate by cohort because each cohort is relatively easy to analyze individually, right? So it's like, you know, breaking a complicated problem into smaller bite-sized pieces, right? And then for valuation, you know, the fact that we could do a sum of cohort valuation, value each cohort separately, add up the value of all the cohorts, and that gives you an overall value for the company. Another thing I wanna point out with the benefit of doing a sum of cohort valuation. Sum of cohort valuation is what I did here, which is I value each individual cohort, I add them up together to get this number. Instead of going, adding up operating income and then NPVing that. What's the benefit of doing this? One benefit is we get to see the value of each individual cohort. And when we see that the cohort values are positive, that means that these unit economics are positive, right? So it gives us the sense, is growth good or not? And if we change the unit economics period by period, we could see when does growth flip from being good to bad, because we would see these numbers flip from being positive to negative. And so it, al it allows us to understand the dynamics of customer acquisition over time too. My point being, we can like make this this template much more elaborate, and we will, right? Um, so that's another important takeaway, is some cohort. By the way, one thing that I'd like you guys to notice is, notice that the sum of cohort valuation is a similar principle to sum of parts valuation, right? Sum of parts valuation, we're doing what? Value division one, value division two, company has both divisions, what's the value of the whole company? It's the sum of the two values. This is the same thing. And there's always many different ways that we can split up a company. We can split it by division. We can split it by cohorts, right? If we split, value each piece and add up, it should always give us the value of the whole thing. So when we're doing sum of cohorts valuation, the logic behind that is the same as a sum of parts valuation. And that's why, you know, if we value all the cash flows, aggregated at once versus disaggregated by cohort and added the NPV of each cohort, we got the same answer. So it's just a, you know, it's useful to recognize like it's the same principle at play, 
because it helps you guys get comfortable with splitting your valuation problems in a variety of different ways where in one context, it makes sense to split by division. In another context, it makes sense to split by cohort. It depends on the type of company you're valuing. Um, you know, other thing I'll point out, what we did was basically a bottom-up forecasting exercise because we went from the customer level to the overall company level, right? As opposed to starting with the whole market and trying to narrow down to the company level, right? So, you know, whenever you think of a forecasting exercise, you know, you always think like, you know, are you taking more of a, a bottom-up or a top-down approach? Here, we really had to go bottom up by starting at the customer level because it was so important for us to go and do a cohort analysis. Um, and then the final thing I want us to get out of our discussion here is the fact that like the examples we've built do bear a relationship to the real world. A lot of the numbers I have, even though I made some stylized assumption, a lot of the numbers I picked we're really off of real world data. And so my hope is, A, you see, how am I picking, how am I using real world data to get the inputs to my model? And if we look at the output of the model, prediction about revenue, prediction about operating income, and value, the numbers we're getting are in line with what we see in the real world. And that should hopefully add some credibility to this, to, to what we've done in this exercise so far. I'm not just doing here um, a purely you know, academic classroom exercise that doesn't really say anything realistic about planet Earth. The goal here was to help us recognize some important observations that are realistic about recurring revenue businesses that are high growth. So I would try to make sure off of the simple example that you guys are comfortable with all four of these points here, right? So one of the things I'm gonna do after we do part two of this lecture, so the next part of the lecture, or sorry, the next part of this topic, um, I will make myself available to talk through the templates that we have with you if you're not completely comfortable with the template. So I wanna be available to make sure you guys are comfortable with that because I think it delivers something of practical value for your careers, right? Because of the rise of SaaS, the rise of recurring revenue, and the fact that this, mod, like this financial model is a bit different by disaggregating by cohort than um, I think what we typically teach in, in, in corporate finance valuation type exercises. So hopefully, you know, hopefully this has uh, you know, taught you guys something a little bit new about this growing segment of uh, the investment universe. Um, I see some additional questions, and I am sorry for uh, going over time here. So I know some people have uh, you know, uh, left or gotten tired of hearing me speak. Um, um, but again, hopefully this has been so far useful. Again, next, next lecture, our goal is to take this example and make it even more realistic and create a template that's even more flexible. So I see questions also by Ken and Audrey. Maybe I'll take Ken first. Yeah, so um, actually it's regarding the model. I noticed that if we increase the uh, growth rate after year six, so the perpetual growth rate, if we increase it from zero to, uh, to let's say 10%, that will actually decrease the net present value of the company. Does that mean at the, in this current version? Uh, wait, 10%? Yeah, I think it decreased the MPV at T equals to zero. So does it mean that um, in this version of the template of this model, we're not uh, encouraging oh. a higher growth rate? Uh, well, so, yeah, okay, so interestingly enough, okay, so there might be a small error in my template. Um, yeah, I think in this template, uh, because of the higher acquisition cost of customers, so that will be related to... Uh, um, let me hold off on answering that question. I'll, I'll answer that question beginning of next lecture, um, because these two numbers should give us the same. So there's something that went a little bit wrong, and I think there's basically just 
and error here. Mm. So there's mm. something there's something went, that went slightly wrong here. It's probably just a little silly mistake that I made. Okay. Um, because these two numbers should give us the same thing, and this one did go up, and this one I more carefully generated. Mm -hmm. Because I always recommend doing this valuation instead of this one. This is what I call the sum of cohorts valuation. Okay. Um, uh, just so, so I apologize for that. I will, I will fix that. Okay. Um, by the way, but, just no. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so th just a general principle here. Because this number was positive, and because these unit economics are assumed to be constant over time, when we increase any of these numbers, the valuation should go up. Because what this is saying is, we're growing faster, getting customers add value. So growing, growing more, growing faster should be better. Yeah, I think so. The fact that this went down is 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 a sign that there's just something silly that I did in that in that. Yeah, I don't know. I. I don't know exactly where I screwed up there, but I'll, 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 I'll fix it. And okay. uh, thanks, for, thanks for pointing that out, Ken. Uh, yeah, I have a question as well. So I know that this is like the uh, beginning version of, of a more sophisticated model. So I want to know yeah. for a more sophisticated model, uh, would the customer acquisition cost decrease as the company sizes increase? Yeah, so, um, so I'll give you like a jet, like a, like what the, I'll tell you two things. So first is generally, as companies grow more and more, their unit economics get a bit worse. Happens for two reasons, because they, they try to acquire the easiest customers first. And as you try to acquire tougher and tougher customers, the cost of acquiring them goes up. But also as you grow and become pretty prominent, you invite competition, which lowers your margins, right? So generally, um, unit economics erode over time. But that's not always true. So there are some examples of companies where their unit economics get better over time. Right? So it's not a, a universal principle. Um, let me just tell you, like, the most typical company uh, where the numbers get better over time. And that's companies that have, like, network effects businesses. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens with a network effects business? As your, net, as your customer base, i.e. your network gets larger and larger, your product becomes more valuable to everyone. And when your product becomes more valuable, it becomes easier to acquire new customers, and you can maybe even charge more for the product. Right? So, so if you look at companies that have a strong network effect of sorts, those are the companies where you might actually see unit economics get better. But for the, for, but for the typical SaaS company or recurring revenue business, you do typically see that um, cost of customer acquisition goes up uh, and maybe like the benefit of, um, of, uh, of an acquired customer uh, goes, goes down over time. So that's actually, I'll, I'll actually mention one more thing. <laughs> That's actually one of the reasons why when, I, when most people analyze a recurring revenue business that's high growth right now, when they try to decide, and this actually goes, expands a little bit more on Lily's question earlier, how do we judge the effectiveness of customer acquisition, right? You might think in this example, oh, well, even if you paid 450000 it's still, you know, worth 50000 per customer, right? Um, you know, as opposed to 260. So you might think like, hey, so long as this number is bigger than zero, you should be happy. Now, most VCs, for instance, when they're trying to decide is this a, a VC fundable company, they don't want this number to be just a bit above zero. They want it to be sufficiently above zero. In particular, a standard calculation that people do is they take the NPV of the benefits Right, so they take, you know, what is the value, the present value of all the future benefits? Well, that's 500. And then uh, this is sometimes called the LTV of a customer, the long-term value of a customer. So the value of the customer once you've got them. And then they divide that by the customer acquisition cost.
And this is something called the LTV to CAC ratio. LTV to CAC ratio, right? Long-term value, the present value of all of this stuff in perpetuity to the cost. VCs want this number to be usually above two. And for very high like marketing expense businesses, uh, like for instance, enterprise SaaS as opposed to consumer SaaS, they actually oftentimes would like to see this number above three even. Um, if this number is above one, this number is greater than zero. So they want like a margin of safety above positive NPV at the customer level to justify making aggressive continued investments in customer acquisition. Why do they do that? It's because they realize if we send you a bunch of money for you to spend on sales and marketing, probably the unit economics are going to get worse. So if you're just a little bit above zero right now, if you, like, if you start aggressively continuing your marketing, it can pretty quickly go from above zero to below zero. Meanwhile, if you're like, if this number is sufficiently positive, even if, it's, if it falls, it's still positive. So I'm not sure if I went a little bit on a tangent here, but these are actually really important core themes associated with the analysis of these businesses. Um, for the high growth companies, we expect these numbers to get worse over time. And so this unit level economics is something that is very closely tracked, both by startups and investors in startups, like VCs or late stage PE, uh, late stage startup PE investment. Uh, Audrey, you have a, uh, did, did you have another uh, continuation question, Ken, or did this kind of address them? I did, I did. thank you. My pleasure. Uh, Audrey, you had a question? Yes, so for the net present value when we add T is equal to three, why yeah. didn't add the cash flow at T equal to three? Oh yeah, that was just, by the, that was just an assumption. Um, so the mm -hmm. assumption I made is that the IPO just after that loss happens. Okay, I see you. Yeah. Um, so one thing I will point out is I'm a little bit inconsistent here. I assume this valuation happens just before this loss. And here I assume the IPO happens just after this loss. So it's an inconsistency between the two. Um, I am going to post an update of the spreadsheet and I was going to comment that, um, that it's post the loss in, in my comments of, of that right there. But yeah, it's a, it's a, I, it's a, I made a different assumption. Again, usually when we think of an I, IPO, like that next cash flow is next period, right? It's, it's not something that's happened at this moment. Okay, I see, yeah, thank you. No problem. Any, uh, any other questions? Hi, yes, I have a question. Hi, Tony. So is uh, growth always related to unit economics? Like, or, or do you have to take some class and- Yeah, so, um, so I, that's a great question. So, um, by the way, these are, these are good questions. And also they kind of hit on, right? Because you want to be comfortable with two things here. You want to be comfortable with doing the rigorous template, the model, but you also want to have good intuition on everything that's driving stuff, right? Um, so when I think about the, if I wanted to like oversimplify, right? If I wanted to oversimplify, the value of a recurring revenue business is basically the product of two things. It's the unit level economics and the growth rate of your customer base, right? The more customer growth, well, okay, it's a product of three things. Your current size, your unit economics, and your growth rate of customer base. The more your customer base grows, your value goes up, but only if your unit economics is positive. If your unit economics is negative, growth is bad, right? So yeah, it's not just the unit economics. It's also about customer growth rates. As long as your unit economics are, are positive, if you have higher growth, it means it's a positive thing. Exactly, right. So no level exactly. for it. Like, is there like something maybe that, that if you add too much, uh, even if your unit economics are positive at some point, uh, they will turn negative if you, for example, add too much uh, customers to yeah. your... Uh... So, so mathematically, right, if 
changing the growth rate does not change the unit economics, then mathematically, more growth better when unit economics is positive. Now, what happens in the real world is there's a tug of war between the two. If you increase your growth rate, you probably lower your unit economics. And so what actually happens in the real world, and I think this is what your intuition is telling you, is that like you've got good unit economics right now, but if you like, you know, start spending way too much, like way too aggressively on sales and marketing, is probably not a good thing, is probably what you're thinking. At some point you're growing too much. You're trying too aggressively. And, and the way to reconcile that is that, you know, when you start growing too much, you start to hurt your unit economics. So how, how can you, for example, if you're trying to evaluate a company, how, how can you uh, like do assumptions on how the growth rate will affect uh, unit economics? Should you, should you have a different unit economic for different, for different periods, like uh, from time zero to time five and time five to time 10 and then thereafter, or how, how would you do it? Yeah, so like, um, so I'm gonna, so two things. One is, right, I, like as we saw in the data, like the rise of SaaS, the rise of recurring, like, like high growth recurring revenue, like that's a recently modern phenomena and it, for the most part, doesn't get taught in classrooms. So what that means is we don't really have um, established best practices for a lot of your questions yet. Um, so, there, so that's important to know because what that implies is there's actually room for you to innovate here, right? If you come up with better approaches to, this, to, to model how these things should change, you potentially have an edge relative to other practitioners in financial services in assessing the values of this business. So I actually think carefully asking yourself that question and trying to see, well, what seems accurate versus not accurate given data and learning from the real world and trying to improve a valuation template like this over time is a worthwhile investment for you to do. Because if you, right, if you wanna be working on something that's intricately related to investment or valuation or, or stuff like this, um, in, in public markets, this is growing in importance. No one questions that. That's definitely, uh, definitely true. So, so the, the practical kind of established question is, uh, the answer is, yeah, we should model these things changing. We don't have guidelines for how they should change. A kind of low hanging fruit thing that could be done to kind of model changing unit economics over time I think would be to look at how customer acquisition costs change over time. Because if you look at companies, you will see that um, companies as they get larger, at least the typical SaaS company, their CAC is going up. So then the question would like, how do you measure CAC? So there's different ways you can measure it. You know, one simple stylized way to measure CAC is look at sales and marketing expense for a company so look at the sales and marketing expense today or whatever, beginning of last year. So last year's sales and marketing expense, and then look at how from last year to this year, the revenue of the company went up. So let's say last year, the revenue was a hundred million. This year it's 200 million. And let's say the sales and marketing expense was uh, 150 million. One way to think is I had to pay $150 million in sales and marketing expense to generate an extra 100 million in revenue this year. And so this is kind of like saying for every dollar increase in revenue, we need to pay one and a half dollars in CAC. And then you could see year by year, how did that number change? Oh, it was $1.5 two years ago Last year, it was $1.75. Well, that suggests that that number is going up over time. But actually, before today, before your presentation, I was, I was thinking about this the other way around. For me, for example, is, is like these companies with recurring revenue or uh, like high-tech companies like Facebook and stuff like that are highly valued because they could 
monetize their customer base better in the future. For example, they can generate more revenue for their, not, not, the, not the other way around. Like, uh, so I, I, I didn't think about Absolutely. it, as, as you said, uh, like uh, they're paying too much now on marketing and afterwards they won't be paying as much and then they will, they will, they will become, uh, uh, they, they will have positive profits instead of. Uh, Absolutely. Like, so. Absolutely. So one thing that's important to keep in mind, you know, so some of the statements I'm making are kind of like, you know, rough averages as opposed to one size fits all. Remember I said earlier, like there's one, you know, one class of companies that tend to have improving unit economics over time are companies with networks of network effect businesses. Okay. Facebook is a network effects business, right? Mm -hmm. The more people that are on Facebook, the more valuable Facebook service is to each customer. And as a result, the more they can monetize, right? So that's like a company like, like a Facebook, like a LinkedIn, when it was a standalone company, like those are companies where we expect the unit economics to actually improve as opposed to get worse. Okay. Uh, there's no I, network so. effect. Maybe it's, maybe if there's no network effect, it's better maybe to think about it. Like how much, how much are they paying in order to generate this amount of revenue? And then, and then maybe estimate your, your, your future unit uh, economics. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, exactly. But again, these, what I will also emphasize is these are all still kind of open questions because like the way that I approach trying to understand how those dynamics should change is I, I want to look at data, right? And it's great. Now we have a bunch of SaaS companies that are publicly traded. Um, and so we can look at their historical data but we're still trying to figure out, well, okay, not, not every SaaS company is the same, so we should put them into different buckets. And some SaaS companies have only been public for a year or two years. So that's not enough data to really get a sense of how unit economics change, especially in the more long term, right? So even if I wanna take a data-oriented approach to try to think about modeling those dynamics, like I don't have enough historical data yet to answer those questions in more than kind of a cartoonish manner. Mm -hmm. But as we get more data over time, which we will continue to get because these companies are here to stay, we will be able to get a better and better sense on this stuff. So I, you know, the punchline here is I'm teaching you guys basics and you know, we'll talk a little bit about modeling some more realistic features. But my goal here is to give you guys the tools to do the modeling correctly. But you guys want to build on this going forward to make the best model possible. And that means also building a habit of keeping track of data. Um, you know, one useful thing about this spreadsheet as well is I have given you guys all the data as well. So for instance, on this BVP Emerging Cloud Index, I have all the members of the um, Bessemer Venture Part, uh, Partners Index. And then for those, all those companies, uh, I mean, I didn't do everything, but from 2015 to 2019, I give you guys their revenue numbers, cost of revenue, operating expenses specifically from sales and marketing, all other operating expenses. Other operating income is zero for everything, but I had collected it just in case. All this stuff was, by the way, automatically generated using Bloomberg's Excel add-in, um, you know, and then I calculate some ratios of interest, you know, uh, percentage revenue growth, uh, cost of revenue as a percentage of revenue, so on and so forth. I can talk to you guys about some of these components later on. Um, but the, the main punchline here is let's use real world data to inform on some of these numbers um, and to think about how we can measure things like, um, cost of customer acquisition. And then once we have a way to measure it, how do we, um, how do we try to assess how that number changes over time for a typical enterprise SaaS company, right? This is all work that like really isn't like an established habit in real world valuation practices. But I think, you know, if, if you have discipline and rigor in doing that, as I said, it can create an advantage vis-a-vis -vis other people trying to value this stuff. So to me, it's like, you know, oftentimes, you know, when you're thinking about um, how to, how to like achieve the highest potential in your career, you want to think about how you can innovate 
in a way that aligns well with trends that we see in the market. Well, innovating more rigorous and realistic valuation practices for recurring revenue, I think is something in financial services that can help you have a more promising career, precisely because A, the, the existing tools are underdeveloped, right? Like the, simple, like the simple thing that I'm developing it is literally cutting edge for most valuation, but ex as you rightfully point out, leaves out a lot of things that we believe are probably important, right? Um, so there's a lot of room for improvement and it's a growth area because it's becoming a larger and larger share of, of you know, technology, of public markets, of private markets, right? So it's becoming more important. It becomes a, like applying, you're gonna be able to apply this for a higher and higher percentage of the valuation exercises that you're gonna to wanna to do going forward relative to the past. I'm not sure, I'm probably belaboring the point here, but um, hopefully you guys believe me when I say that I think this is potentially valuable for you guys. Thank you so much. No problem. Audrey, did you have another question? No, that's just from previous. All right. Okay, okay, cool. Um, all right, I think that basically wraps up what, we, what I wanted to do for um, part one of, the, uh, of, of this topic. I will like play around a little bit with this simple example at the uh, beginning of tomorrow's class. But the main thing I'll do in tomorrow's class is really extend this example to add more realism. Um, I probably won't do much, uh, Tony, on, on the dynamics of unit economics, um, but yeah, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll cook up something uh, to, 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 to add a little bit of flavor on that front. So maybe I'll have a model like increasing CAC over time. Um, uh, but I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to get that number off of a data analysis uh, per se. So it'll be a little bit you know, taken out of thin air. But it becomes something that you can think about measuring off of real world data going forward. Because um, there's no doubt, Tony, like how that changes over time has like a large impact on the actual valuation numbers. Um, if unit, like you'll see like sensitivity analysis on those numbers, gonna be very sensitive. So what that means is, you know, we might not know the best way to do that yet, but we would love to know because it could allow us to do much better job of valuation. Yeah. So, um, all right. So I think this kind of wraps up for today. I realize I went 50 minutes over, um, uh, but I hope this was useful for you guys. And I hope really that there wasn't, this hasn't interfered in other elements of your uh, schedules. I, I do, it's not unusual. Um, for me to go over time and stuff, maybe 15 minutes is a bit, is, is a bit extreme. Um, but again, uh, I wanted to make sure that, you know, you guys get comfortable with this simple basic template. And then uh, for you guys also next step to be comfortable with the more elaborate and realistic versions. Um, and, and that you also, you know, maybe are in a position where you can think, how could I enrich the templates that I provided to you guys, right? Because there's, as I said, as, as Tony alluded to, and has been brought up several times. There's a lot of room for innovation. Um, uh, and yeah, so I hope this was, hope this was helpful. Uh, if there's any final questions or if people have questions about something else, feel free to stick around. I'm happy to answer a few more questions, but otherwise I guess uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. I will post this video. I may not do it today, but uh, you know, in the next, by Friday, I'll make sure to post this video and tomorrow's video on my courses as well. Um, uh, and I, I noticed a couple of typos in my slides. I'll fix the typos and, and, and post an update of, of, of uh, like, like cleaner versions of all the materials as well. It's my first time presenting this, so it's uh, uh, first time you present something, there's always typos. <laughs> Sound good? Did you guys find this interesting, helpful? Uh, I mean, I guess no one will say no, but. <laughs> Um, again, I, I really am a believer that this is uh, of practical value. So, uh, so I hope you guys like it. Sound good? All right. I will, uh, then I guess I'll see you guys, uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a good one, everybody. You have a question, Dakota? Yeah, just, um, 
is there any progress with the access by chance? As uh, okay, so IT did not reach out to you guys. No, not yet. Okay, I'll have to send out another email. Um, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll push a little bit harder on that because I have, I have, I have asked them on a few occasions. They've always yeah. been a bit cryptic, but I, they, they had said that they would reach out to you guys. So I'm not, I'm not, not sure why they haven't yet, but maybe I'll tell them like, Hey, you know, can you just make sure you reach out to them? Yeah. Uh, yeah I don't, okay. I think, I think they're a little bit overwhelmed too, because now they just had like this soon, like huge influx of more demand for access. Yeah. So I'm not sure like, if, yeah. Um, I mean, Sounds of course case, Worst case scenario, I'm going to give you access through mine. Okay. Um, and um, um, and and we'll work we'll work with that. Um, sure. Um, but I'll 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 send another email literally right now, just saying like, hey, can you can you reach out? So it's 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 you, Vartan. Is it also Bruce or not Bruce? Uh, yeah. I mean, Bruce does a lot of work with um, risk management. I think he'd uh, appreciate that. Yeah. So like, uh, I'll send them, I'll send them an email. I'm actually going to CC the three of you guys in the email as well. Um, um, and I, well, then I, it makes me also wonder whether they've contacted other people. Um, uh, because there's a couple of people who had asked about changing their s schedule time because of conflicts with morning class. So yeah. I'll have to ask about that too. Okay. Um, yeah. No rush. All right, cool stuff. I see. I see a change of scenery. I see a fridge now. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I'm making some food now. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, I uh, uh, yeah, you're what you're two hours behind, right? Yeah, two hours behind. Yeah, so I, I realize. I guess I've, I I pushed your uh, your lunch time back. I apologize for that. Yeah, no worries. Uh, no, this was extremely helpful, though. Uh, yeah. Def certainly not. Uh, I don't think it's hot yeah i mean i mean all of this stuff i built myself so like it's yeah. not like i took this from a textbook or um it's it yeah like it's actually like this is one of these things where i feel like i can like classroom treatment of stuff is just lagging behind and, and because of that you actually see like like you, like there's this potential for even practitioners who aren't like some practitioners use these cohort based models some don't yeah. right um yeah. But more often than not, they don't rigorously take the cohort approach. Sure. And with companies like this, it can just lead to these really crazy valuations because okay. you see that like these, like, like recurring revenue businesses are much more sensitive to changes in like unit economics and, mm -hmm. uh, and to growth rates than, um, than, than normal traditional companies. So it becomes actually more important for you to carefully model these things. Um, this, so these kind, of, yeah. these kind of businesses are where like, that's where your unicorns come from within. Oh yeah. Area. Like, I mean, if you, and it's not discussed like, enough. Exactly. All right. So like the recurring revenue mod, I mean, cloud basically entirely transforms software for sure. from perpetual to, to per period licensing. So moved mm -hmm. it from traditional business model to, um, uh, to recurring revenue model. I mean, even like, you know, like think about like the old traditional software companies that I mentioned, right? So uh, Adobe and, uh, and, and Microsoft, they've moved to the cloud and they've moved to like monthly license. Yeah. Right. Well, so yeah. Go, sorry, so, go on. Um, so like, because of that, um, I mean, I guess it, the, the reality is there's, there's many advantages associated. For, in software, it makes sense that once you could do over the cloud, it moved to cloud. Mm -hmm. And once you do to cloud, like once you grant access over cloud, uh, there's an advantage, for instance, like you can make sure that, you know, people actually pay for their license. There was obviously huge privacy issues with for the sure. perpetual license model. Yeah. And, um, and, and also, you know, it becomes easier for like, for you to like implement a pay as you go or a monthly pay type of model, mm -hmm. uh, or even a pay as you use model. Um, and by having smaller payments over time, there's actually more people who are willing to start using the product because they don't need to make that large expenditure of like, 
a thousand dollars for the software up front, which was yeah. you know, uh, yeah. you know uh, something that stopped people from being paid customers for sure uh, in the in the traditional model. So mm -hmm. definitely for software that's happened, um, uh, and for anything kind of internet related. Uh, but even like as commerce has moved online, it becomes a lot easier to like track things at the customer level so that you sure. can start be building these rec like recurring customer models. You can start building a marketing strategy that if someone hasn't used your product for a while or hasn't purchased anything from your store for a while, you can send them information on the sales you offer that are related to products they've purchased in the past. And so all of these things have been you know, like the evolution of technology has even for retail moved things towards like, let's really think about acquiring a customer. Like even if we have to pay a lot to acquire a customer right now, yeah. like we can think about how we recover that more gradually over time. Yeah, um, for sure. And so it's, it's had a profound impact, but it, there's also like a lot of companies that were recurring revenue before recurring revenue became a thing, right? Think like, mm -hmm. like the, the tail end of the distribution channel for pharmaceuticals, right? So pharmaceutical sales, mm -hmm. that was always a recurring revenue model. Um, even if it wasn't necessarily called as such, the thing is that the, the difference with that is like the more kind of established um, businesses that are recurring revenue based, the one difference that they had is they weren't, they aren't as high growth. Yeah. And the yeah. real differences that you see between the patterns on traditional and recurring revenue, that really comes from the segment that is high growth. Once mm -hmm. things be, I mean, in some sense, as you see, like once things become really low growth, let me just make this uh, low growth here. Uh, I'll make it 1% growth, let's say, right? Well, you know, you look at these cash flows, kind of look like they're growing, like they kind of look pretty normal. Or they're just yeah. growing at a, a short rate. Like this weird negative things getting worse before they get better, and that's actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. Like those things really only show up in the in the in the high growth segment. So you know, yeah. using the traditional approach for a recurring revenue business that is growing slowly is is actually okay. Maybe I should have pointed that out in in, in the lecture, but it's yeah. really for the high growth segment where so, you really want to model this carefully. Yeah, for sure. Um, so if you look at Microsoft three years before IPO, they had an operating profit. And now you see a lot of these companies. Um, so like, for example, Square, who they'll IPO before they're profitable. Yep. Um, so obviously that's a trend. I don't know if that has to do with competition. But it seems like these companies are um, IPOing to gain access to capital, and yep. they don't really care about the operating loss. They just want to scale their business as quickly as possible. I mean, and in some sense, like one reason, one reason to be raising capital is to fund losses that you expect. Yeah. In in the future. For sure. Right? If if you don't ever expect to 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 lose money in the future, then you don't need to raise money for the company. You might as well do a direct listing, for instance. Yeah. Right. Like, so, so for instance, like if you look at Spotify, they were there, they were losing money, but mm -hmm. they had plenty of cash. Um, and they expect to be turning profitable relatively soon. So they didn't need to raise money. Lo and behold, they did a direct listing. Now, of course, direct listing is just a recent phenomenon. And really the only two main ones to do a direct listing so far are, are Spotify and Slack. Yeah. Um, but, um, um, and, and, you know, and another thing to keep in mind is like the IPO is not the only route to raise capital in those contexts. Sure. You can, you can raise large private routes now as well. Uh, you know, from like a soft bank, but maybe yeah. they won't be doing that quite as much anymore. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, but there's all, plenty of other players, Co2, uh, mm -hmm. Tiger Global, so on and so forth. Um, but uh, but there's, there's other reasons why companies go public as well. One is you know, yeah. liquidity from the perspective of, of uh, employees, because you know, while it's a private company, even early employees, they might have a high net worth on paper, but they literally have no access to, to actual cash. 
So being able to cash out is something that's, that, that's valuable and you can do that after the lockup period expires following an IPO. Um, but also some companies like Square, for instance, um, I, I know this for a fact because I've, 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 met, I've met Jack Dorsey. My housemate, my first year of grad school was Jack Dorsey's mentor. No way. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, I, I can tell you the story someday. It's a pretty, it's a pretty, yeah, interesting I, one. but because of that, I've had a chance to, to I, I, I've had a chance. I, most of the time when I go to Bay Area, or maybe half of the time I get an opportunity to have like a lunch with, with Dorsey. Okay. Uh, but so I, I, I've asked him this question about the timing of the, the IPO of Square. And for them, a, a big motivation because they could have raised the money in private market. Yeah. Um, one motivation was that they felt that by being public, it would improve their reputation in the face of customers. Wow, okay. Right, so, um, um, right, I mean, it's a, a company is like, it's kind of like from a reputational standpoint, you're more certified once you're publicly traded. Yeah. Um, and so um, I think, you know, you know, it's like some FinTech company, I, 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 it's an interesting question. I, I should take a look at this in the data. But it may be that like relative to other technology companies, fintech companies go public a little bit sooner because they want to have that reputation advantage. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, there's, counter, there's always counterexamples to stuff like Stripe, you know, has really delayed going public. Yeah. Um, um, and they're a fintech company. Yeah, I think it's interesting, like on the topic of, um, fintech how the market's valuing some of these companies um i read a white paper on how valuable a customer is to the bank and how valuable a customer is to square like what the market's currently valuing it at and a customer to the bank is valued at um a much higher value than a customer to uh, like Square or PayPal. Uh, and I think that gap is gonna close. I think it's interesting to think about, but. Yeah, um, I mean, probably like, so, so for instance, like we were talking about customer acquisition costs, mm -hmm. right? So like, you know, one, one very hot um, FinTech company is Robinhood. Yeah, the reason yeah. why they're worth so damn much uh, in, is literally because they have managed to get customer acquisition costs like not just one order of magnitude lower, but like yeah. almost two orders of magnitude lower than um, um, than than traditional brokerage firms. I think like their CAC, like they spend on average fifteen dollars to get a user, um, whereas uh, or to get a a, a brokerage account. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, like Charles Schwab and stuff like that, they trick like TD Ameritrade and some like they traditionally would pay fifteen hundred to get a customer. Really? Yeah. Wow. So, um, now, of course, you know these aren't the same customers. Like, you know, Robinhood's customers, at least right now, have a way lower account balance, so they have a, a shitload of very small balance. But you know, Robinhood, what they say is like these small accounts are going to be big accounts in the future. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like we're getting those accounts, you know, five, 10 years before they would become an E-Trade account or a, yeah. or well, a Schwab account. Uh, but because these accounts are so sticky, you, you start a brokerage account, you don't tend to like move, you know, to like, you know, stop, you know, move away from Schwab and become TD Ameritrade. Once, yeah. you, you, once you pick your, your securities brokerage, you tend to stick with it. Mm -hmm. uh, especially when it's like, um, you know, um, uh, like not full service, but discount brokerage, which is what yeah. all of these folks are. Um, um, you know, they offer a pretty, you know, undifferentiated service. So you just yeah. kind of stick with it. I mean, the same thing, like, I, I mean, I don't know if other people, would do it, but like, I, at least for myself, like if I look at my banking services, I basically stick with, I've stuck my entire life with the same bank yeah. in Canada. And, you know, view stuck, you know, I made one switch at some point out of convenience because of where branches were when mm -hmm. I moved from Boston to Chicago, but there's only been one switch in my life in the U S mm -hmm. and that's it. Like, you know, at, about as sticky as you can get. No kidding. So, yeah. Uh, and that's generally true with like retail commodity financial services. Absolutely. Yeah. 
as, yeah. as, by the way, that also means those, those businesses are recurrent. Like you want to think of them as recurring revenue because yeah. they're sticky customers. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's, I mean, that's one of the biggest things I think you look for in uh, valuing a company is the stickiness of their products. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, absolutely. No doubt. Um, so, so yeah. Um, Anyway, um, I hope I hope people found this uh, you know, interesting and, and potentially useful, and I hope people th spend more time thinking about it, um, uh, like outside of just uh, these lectures. I'm actually going to touch on this again. I'm going to give you guys a homework problem on this theme uh, in the VC course. Um, okay. So at least through my class, you guys are going to see this uh, a bit again. Um, but like my view is like this should be a dedicated segment of any like applied corporate finance course, for instance, like that's valuation focused. Yeah. Uh, this agree. is so important. I mean, like this is the, the only thing that gets in the way of implementing this type of template is that, you know, sometimes, comp especially if you do like do this valuation as an investor, as opposed to someone who works inside the company, yeah. that it's not always easy to get all of this information yeah. uh, from, from historical financials. Uh, although there are some companies that give a lot of information on, you know, their cohort level stuff. Mm -hmm. So you can usually, you can usually glance some stuff. Yeah. No, I, uh, I'm good. good. Yeah. Enjoy, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. I will enjoy it by making the, the set of slides for tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you um, then. All right. Cool stuff. See you tomorrow, man. Take care. Have a good one.